welcome all, welcome, settle in, find your way around, make sure that you have your chat window enabled so that you can join in actively with this session. And welcome from me uh, to this um, series of Aleph Trust Dialogues. Uh, my name is Jessica Bockler and I'm one of the co-founding directors of the Aleph Trust. And uh, I'm your session host today, together with my colleague, Professor Les Lancaster, who is also here. It's a more intimate session today, so we really hope to get stuck in with you and uh, enjoy a deeper dialogue together and some deeper exploration. So Les and I are co-founding directors of the Aleph Trust, a nonprofit organization based in the UK. And the Aleph Trust is active in education and in community service. We deliver programs uh, and courses in consciousness studies, in integral psychology, transpersonal psychology, those kinds of fields. And our postgraduate courses are validated by Liverpool John Moores University. And um, Les and I are hosting a series of dialogues with colleagues in the field of transpersonal studies over um, these summer, summer months, summer here in the UK, um, exploring the themes that are touching so many of us right now, living through this unprecedented time with the pandemic that is affecting uh, so many people's lives in so many different ways. And we want to really explore with you um, how we can not only cope um, and, and make sense of the uncertainties we're facing, but also how we can shift these experiences from a sense of hardship, from a sense of crisis, a sense of contraction, a sense of falling apart, disintegrating, towards something that is more grounding, more expansive, and perhaps opening the aperture of our awareness towards new possibilities. And so today, Les and I are in dialogue with our colleague Kendra Diaz Ford. And uh, Kendra is a transpersonal psychologist, as well as a spiritual guide and a, a yoga teacher. And she earned her PhD in transpersonal psychology from Sophia University uh, in the United States. Um, and she specialized in education in spiritual guidance and in women's spirituality. So Kendra is very deeply immersed in women's spiritual development and health, as well as authentic leadership and the role that the sacred feminine uh, plays in today's world or needs to play a larger role. And we're going to dive with Kendra today into the topic of transpersonal self-authorship. We're going to unpack what we mean by that. Um, but this is not just a dialogue between uh, Kendra, myself and Les, but also very much with you. And that's why we'd like to encourage you to use the chat window, find that chat window. Right now, actually, you can share with us uh, where you're based. Uh, let us know why you're here as well. So type a few sentences into the chat window right now. What brings you here today? And we're going to keep a, a close eye on that. And then apart from that, we want to invite you to engage creatively in this session. So if you have pens and paper to hand, wonderful, then we invite you to, to doodle, to draw, to sketch, to mark, make during this session, scribing what arises within you in response to the dialogue that you're witnessing. You may also be a person who is more kinesthetically oriented, very much you know, sensing into the body and, and moving. So again, I feel encouraged to do that. I'm certainly one such person and I'll be, I'll be doing that with you um, I, because we want to invite in not just the intellect, but a kind of whole bodied intelligence, bringing the whole self into this session. So you know, kinesthetic intelligence is, is uh, very much welcome, that embodied, deeper, heart-based, intuitive uh, wisdom. We want to invite that into the room with you today because all of these are ways of sense-making, of meaning-making, ways of authoring ourselves, and that very much um, kind of mirrors what this session is about. So we want to kind of embody and engage in those ways, as well as talk about what transpersonal self-authorship can mean uh, to all of us. We're recording the session. 
Um, so we're going to share it later on, of course, with others. So if you prefer not to be video recorded, then just bear that in mind and you can turn your webcam off. But of course, we'd love to see you. Um, it makes a big difference. So if you feel like it, please do keep your webcam on. It's lovely to see you. But I'd like to um, hand over now to Les and Kendra so that you can, we could get the ball rolling and explore what transpersonal self-authorship might mean in, in this larger context. Thank you, Jessica. And Kendra, it's great to have you here in this session. And welcome to you, obviously. Now, Thank you. I'm fascinated by the title. That's where I want to start. <laughs> transpersonal self-authorship. I wonder if you want to unpack that a little to start us off. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to say thank you, Jessica, for that introduction and, and to you, Les, also for getting us uh, started today. Um, yeah, so transpersonal authorship the, the, or self-authorship. Um, the term self-authorship comes from developmental psychology. So there is um, a developmental psychologist, Robert Keegan, who, um, term, who came up with this term self-authorship. And essentially what it, what it is is during the ages of 18 to about 30, he states that we go through this process where we start to build our own understanding of the world more from an internal place rather than an external place. So using past experiences, uh, how we're making sense of the world, what is that we're noticing that we begin to value, how we're developing our morals, and of course there's different ways in which that gets shaped from the societies, the communities that we live in, the families that we were raised in, the, the, the interests that we might have, the activities that we participate in. And through this phase of our life, we, we start to really develop a, a, a much more concrete sense of identity that is, that is much more um, coming from a place of uh, internal capacity rather than just you letting the external environment um, decide who we are in the world. And so um, this is, self-authorship is really a concept and a term that I've been uh, working with over the course of the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so. And um, it's only recently that I, I paired it together with transpersonal to, to, to come up with transpersonal self-authorship. So, you know, this is, it's, a, it's new, it's a new concept, I think, even for me to put, to put these two together. Um, so in some ways, it's, it's an emergent um, concept. And um, how I'm looking at it or the way in which I've sort of been evolving it in my own understanding is, especially within context of what's happening in the world. So, you know, in my experience and in, in some of the experiences of others that I've had conversations with just during this time of COVID and, and Corona, is that there's been this major breakdown. There's been a way in which perhaps the identities that were, we, we as you know, individuals were associating ourselves with, let's say, you know, um, here in America, we often say when we meet somebody, you know, it, the, one of the first questions that you often get asked is, well, what do you do? And we're not asking about what it is that you like to do, but what's your job essentially? And so a lot of, a lot of people's identities are really, um, woven with their job title. And so let's say, for instance, that job no longer exists because, you know, because something, because of Corona, right? So who are you without that title, right? Who are you when the breakdown starts to happen? And so transpersonal self-authorship was really this, this idea of when, when you've already established your identity, an understanding or, or construct of who you are in the world and this kind of breakdown happens where that identity perhaps is no longer relevant and perhaps there's a big relief that it's no longer relevant it's an opportunity to to look at well what are my values today and perhaps because we're having this experience, I mean, I think that we all in some way can agree that right, we've had this common experience. We're all going through a global pandemic 
together, even though each of us are having our own unique experiences within this, this common experience, there's a way in which we immediately as human beings were, were brought into relationship with the wholeness of, of each other. And, you know, transpersonal meaning, you know, there's several different ways in which we define it, but, you know, one way we define it is, 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 is being whole, right? Being this interconnected wholeness that we have with each other. And so, you know, thinking about transpersonal author, self-authorship, I think is a, it's this, it's another opportunity to go through that, that, that constructive, um, you know, process of building identity, perhaps with a set of, of different values or yeah. um, different viewpoints or ways of connecting to self and connecting to self with, with others. And, and perhaps to look at some of the areas that, you know, in that phase of time when identity was being um, constructed, perhaps there were parts of the self that were, that were ignored or left out, not because, you know, for any part, you know, each, each individual would have their own unique reasons for that. But, you know, with this type of breakdown, um, we sometimes come into deep connection with what we weren't paying attention to. Right. So th right. It's, right, it's an opportunity for that. It's uh, so many, so many points spark in relation to what you're saying there. And uh, so I've got a number of, <clears throat> of questions that seem to come through uh, just listening to you. And I can imagine that others will as well. And of course, there's the chat window, just to remind everyone. And later, we'll get into a question and answer with, with uh, everyone who's participating. So I'm thinking that uh, maybe there's a slight tension in, in the title itself. Mm -hmm. transpersonal self-authorship because I mean you mentioned Keegan and and that's a very constructivist approach I would say and yes you explained that very well you know that uh, we create our world we create our sense of self etc and yet on the transpersonal side I think some would want to say that there's a part of ourselves that we don't construct maybe I don't. I hesitate to use the word, but uh, in a religious age, it, it would have been called soul. Yeah, something that you know that maybe the transpersonal part of the equation, as it were, is about connecting with something deeper within oneself that's already there. It's mm -hmm. part of your heritage, mm -hmm. and and there's so that's this is the tension, isn't it? That that side yep. of it versus actually the sense of self that I am aware of day by day is constructed and that's where the point you raise you know about all the values and how you know the current pandemic that's all part of the construction so I wonder if there is that tension do you think there's a tension there yeah and you know what you know what word comes up for me when you bring that up is is the word paradox right the way in which they perhaps they're both existing but not in but not in negation of each other, but in relationship to each other. And I think that that perhaps is maybe, you know, um, I think what you're highlighting is a really important piece because, you know, some of, some of this breakdown, right? If we're, if, if we're, if there is this sort of falling apart of this, of this identity that we've identified ourselves with so strongly, what, what is there when the breakdown happens? Right? Is it is it this part of ourselves that's always been there that's just been been waiting to be revealed, mm -hmm. right? That we're just now noticed, and then and then it's then what happens? I think that's that's really the part for me. I think that's that is part of the emergent quality of this this concept is when those identities or those constructs break down, or when you've had the opportunity to be broken open. And you notice that you, you're still there, that there's still something there. Well, then, then what? What is then the, the constructing process, right? Then what happens? How do you then rebuild? Um, is, it, is, it, is it a way, do you allow that part of yourself that, that was already there to be the one that guides that process, mm -hmm. right? Um, versus just reorganizing the self based on those old concepts and identities, 
right? And I think that that's maybe what I'm trying to point towards. Yeah, um, yeah, I get You that. know, in, yeah, I mean, uh, in, so I, one of, so my, my, my spiritual practice is, is based in, is based in Tantra, and I've been practicing authentic uh, Shakta Tantra for about 10, 10, 12 years now. And there's sort of this idea that the practices aren't to, they aren't to sort of build yourself through the practice, but rather to um, release the veils that are clouding your own ability to see who you really are. Yeah. And so perhaps, you know, with such a, a dramatic and fast shift in our, in our world, in our local communities, in our, in our global communities, that these veils that perhaps we had, you know, even from being able to see each other across, across continents or to see ourselves, you know, in, in relationship to others, um, that there's this opportunity to really not only understand who we are individuals in this world and to, to perhaps rebuild or to, to integrate parts of the self that weren't yeah. integrated before, but it's, also to do it in a different way. You know, it's interesting to think of these these strange days we're living in in terms of opportunity i mean obviously it's not to it's not to brush out that many people are suffering and and that's really hard but it reminds me of the previous session where steve taylor was talking with steve taylor and he was emphasizing the point about acceptance and the role that mm -hmm. acceptance plays in you know, sort of spiritual development um, and actually, it was reminded me of another point. Uh, I remember various workshops I've been involved in over the years, and this started with um, someone I deeply respected who died a number of years ago, who was a Zen teacher, and and he introduced in the workshop this exercise. I'm sure many of them is quite common, really. I think many will have done that, where you're in a pair, and there's just one question. That is, who are you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, you're working with that and you're just old, you know, old your partner asks and you ask and you answer. and Yeah, I'm, I'm so-and-so, this is my name, this is my work, this is who I am. And, and the more you go, it's like you said about the veils, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's related to that question I asked. And the way you answered it makes me think of a, a very, uh, maybe a, a contemporary way of looking based in the sort of quantum arena, which is, you know, it's not either or, it's both and. Mm -hmm. And and it is paradoxical, I agree with you, totally agree with you. But, um, so you said a little about your own practice. Would you say that is what has led you to this whole notion of transpersonal self-authorship, or is it more the sort of research that you're doing, or maybe, maybe they're both the same? Maybe that's both <laughs> end as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I yeah I do think it's it's a little bit of both. I mean, um, when I first was introduced to the concept of self authorship, I was in the process of writing my dissertation, and I was writing my my dissertation on uh, women's spiritual stories, and in 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 asking women about their their spiritual stories they they were revealing the ways in which some very specific challenges that they had had in their lives shaped the way in which they then built their identity after after that experience and i too when i was you know um subsequently actually when i first started my my graduate studies um, I think when I think the year I started was 2008, 2009. I can't remember the exact year. Um, I also went through a pretty big experience in my life where everything that I thought I thought was important in my life all of a sudden didn't become was no longer was no longer important. And I felt very grateful that I had not only the structure of my, my uh, graduate school and community there, but also my spiritual community to help me frame and understand, you know, sort of give a container, if you will, to, to help me look at, well, 
if I no longer have the foundation that I thought was the foundation of my life, what is the foundation that I'm going to then live from? And so there is a way in which I've sort of gone through this experience myself um, and, and feel as if I'm going through it in some ways again because of, because of you know, being um, in the current times with, with corona. Um, and so I think it's asked me to sort of go a little bit deeper mm -hmm. into this question around, you know, how, first of all, how do we, how do we make meaning of our experiences, especially the ones that are deeply challenged? What do we do when, when the parts of ourselves or even the, the, everything about ourselves we thought was important and relevant all of a sudden become unimportant? And when we start to notice that the things that we sort of built around ourselves is, are no longer there, well, first of all, what's left? And then, and then what do, and then what, you know, how yeah. do I then, how do I then rebuild from here? And so I think I've seen it, you know, in my life in a couple of different iterations and also in just my, my research, you know, one, how um, both the way in which we, we talk about our experiences, the stories that we tell, we, we tell ourselves and we tell other people about our experiences um, and whether, you know, and I was thinking about that even, the telling, the telling of our experience doesn't have to always be verbal. It can be through, you know, if, if you're a dancer, there's ways in which we, you know, our, these stories are also living within the body. It's just not, it's not just about what, how the mind constructs and what the mind, how the mind makes meaning, but it's also how the body makes meaning and how the body presence is, you know. Um, indeed, indeed. You know. And... Uh, and also, it's not just individual. I mean, I think that's the point you're making in relation to the pandemic at the moment. I mean, I think, right. you know, this notion of breaking down and breaking through, uh, I mean, if you read the, the, the mystical spiritual literature, is that the dark night of the soul, different, yes. you know, different crises. And of course, I think, you know, many of the people here people you know the people students who come to onto our programs you know uh, many if not most have been through those kinds of experiences i think but yes. you know th there's different levels different scale on which those experiences occur but i think the, the point i just i think this will be the last question but I, I just wanted to raise this point about the the levels of organization so you know you're talking about the individual um and it seems to me that that there's correspondence in all things in a way. That's another mystical idea. So, you know, the, 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 there is the individual, the individual's narrative, which creates self or their, you know, their, their sense of their role in the larger. And so now we're in the larger, we're part of communities, all kinds of different communities from, you know, just the sort of groups that we're involved in. And then to the level of the country, the, um, beyond a global community and I think you know it is an interesting way and I'll frame it in the way of a question but I think I'm just sort of making that point for myself as well that just as you know there's a, a way in which the self is being created as a narrative so the collective self the collective story is mm -hmm. being recreated through these days and maybe you know maybe this is getting a bit over spiritual or mystical but you know maybe that's what's going on you know the larger whole is challenging us because a new narrative needs to be born mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean i think i can i can agree with you on that on that statement Les. i think you said it really well um you know i think that and 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 i I think that as a result of that, you know, um, it, it just continues to loop back into each other, right? As, as we're building, as we're building a, a global narrative, the ways in which we as individuals are interacting with ourselves and with the world is going to shift and, and it will just continue to be this feedback yeah. loop and require us to, you know, maybe it's, maybe that's what it is. The, the, the breakdown, right, the breakdown of these, these individual sort of, um, you know, containers or identities that we've put ourselves in because we have, um, and, and you, you, you pointed this out really well at the beginning, that 
you know, um, with the constructivist viewpoint that I most certainly hold, right, in that our immediate environments and our experiences construct the ways in which we make meaning in the world. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as we start to expand what, 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 our what our communities are and who our communities are, the ways in which we make meaning in, in the world and how we un understand ourselves in relationship to, to each other, I think will shift. And yeah. not just to each other as humans, but to other creatures, to, to the yes. planet. I think there's yes. something around that narrative. Yes. And, uh, and again, narrative is a great term because that question about planetary responsibility, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's difficult to pinpoint what's the objectivity. You know, there's arguments one way or another, climate change, there's human effects, not human effects. But at some point, and I think we've seen this over the last five years, I would say, at some point the narrative shifts. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I think at that, that larger scale, the narrative has shifted and, and will continue to do so. So I think, yeah, this is the last point to say, but it's just... To, to hold up that mirror, you know, that mirror through which you're looking at yourself, yes, because myself is a construct to some extent, maybe there's a deeper soul, who knows, but it is a mirror of the larger scale and, yeah. you know, the microcosm, macrocosm, and perhaps that's, 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 that's the bit that, you know, politicians, whoever, don't get, they can't get. Mm -hmm. you know, and maybe that's going back to your title, which as I say was a great title, that's the point of the transpersonal bit. The transpersonal mm -hmm. is recognizing these different levels and and that gives us more responsibility. Absolutely. Yeah, and recognizing it within within each other. And I think it goes back, you know, as you were mentioning narrative, you know, going back to that idea of narrative or, or story, it's that, you know, as we communicate these stories and then we, we communicate it to somebody perhaps we've, we've just met and, and we see them go, yeah, that's my experience too. There's a way in which, which those raw experiences that we've been having are then not only you know, reflected back to us, but then that's the way in which we start to then build a, a deeper understanding because yeah. we see, oh yeah, there's this acknowledgement that yeah, you too had that experience, exactly. even though you've had it in your own unique way, exactly. but there's a similarity that we yeah. all can connect to. That's great. I think, yeah. I think that's really important and we'll end there because I think that is a really important aspect. Um, I'm going to pass back to Jessica, but just yeah. to again make clear that uh, there'll be time later for the, the, the audience to participate. So we'll, hopefully there'll be more expansion of transpersonal self-authorship. Thank you, Kendra. Thank you, Les. Thank you, Kendra and Les. And as I've been listening to you, I've been sensing into the body and noticing what's stirring for me. I've been drawing as well and mapping the words and what's been sort of emerging in terms of my imagery and the kind of movement impulses, what have I been noticing? And what stuck with me is the, the word breakdown. And it appeared like a zigzag line. It felt like a, um, like a bolt of lightning, very hot, very tense. And then the breakdown of the word into break and down. Break in the sense of something disintegrating, but also something um, pausing. So it can be a break, can be a pause. It can be a place of disintegration. Yeah, it can be those two things which is kind of fascinating really actually, isn't it? When you look into that word and the downward sensation was very strong as well. And the image that emerged for me was that of the earth. And I'm saying that and I'm feeling my feet on the earth. And that sense of the larger collective body that we're all inhabiting and connecting to and I'd like to invite you all now to explore that in your own body, <laughs> your own body. We're all one body in a sense. Let's feel into our collective body. Let's sense inward a little. So 
This might just be a little adjustment of your posture on the chair. If you're happy to stand up because you are more drawn towards moving, then feel free to do that. But just take a moment to pause and allow that descent from the mental energy into the more body-centered space. Maybe your eyes are closed. Maybe you're lowering your eyelids. Arriving home into the body. Notice where you're landing as I'm saying that. Is that in the heart space? Noticing the flow of the breath. Is it more in the belly? Noticing a sense of impulse, action, wanting to initiate something, or perhaps it's a more contemplative space. Just notice where you are right now in your own body. Arriving, sensing inward, sensing downward, descending, feet on the ground. And maybe you can notice how you're holding yourself. What posture are you inhabiting? And breathe into that more deeply. Really allow our awareness to sink into the embodied sensations. Notice how has the dialogue been touching you? Where are you feeling the words that have been spoken? As I'm saying that, I'm noticing a movement sensation in the knees, slight vibration. And so I'm going with that, noticing that, allowing the knees to lead me as I'm moving now. So you follow through in your own way. Maybe you want to be still. Maybe you want to move a little. Really pay attention to what is happening for you in this very gentle, soft, listening in and movement exploration. It can be small movement. It could be just embodied sensing. Stay present with your process. Now, if you have pen and paper, I'd like to invite you to shift medium. Pick up pen and do a little doodling on the paper, noticing what movement patterns want to manifest on the page. Allow the imagination to roam freely. Let the body lead. If you don't have pen and paper, you can use your fingers on the table. Play with your fingers. Let your fingers draw. If you don't have a table, draw in the air. So shifting to a drawing, doodling, mark-making medium.
not thinking too much about it. Remember to stay connected to the body and the breath as you're doing this. So allowing yourself to play a little on the page, but not losing yourself in the mind, in the process. So keep this embodied. It's almost as if you're dancing on the paper. And then let's pause for a moment. Notice what's in front of you, if you have been drawing. Take a look at the image that is there. If you have been doodling in the air or on the desk, in the table in front of you, then pause to remember what kind of patterns were present. What were those movement patterns? What were those qualities that were expressing themselves through you? But take a look, if you have been drawing or doodling, take a look at what's on the paper in front of you. And then add a word or two. If you were to give this image or give these movement patterns a title, how would you name them? And feel free to add these words to the page. And then I'd like to invite you to share something of that process in the chat window. So you might want to place some words there that were emerging for you, something that you observed in yourself in response to the dialogue, maybe a question that arose for you. So let's move it into the chat window now and uh, share something there of the process gold nuggets, insights, observations, and also questions. So we're going to have all eyes on the chat window. Mirella writes, growing roots, achieving balance. Yeah, keep them coming in. 2020, the year of two worlds, says Owen. Sensing the two. 2020, two twos, huh? Unseen nature, says Shannon. Unseen nature. Mm. And Yani writes, an internal whirlpool that evolves in uh, to the outside. An internal whirlpool that evolves to the outside. Okay, what a fascinating image. I'm just feeling into that as I'm reading it. And then Owen has a, a vase of flowers. And Sharifa, flow and gratitude, flow and gratitude. Owen writes, a free bird of the breath. And Sophia, finding balance, 
when feeling arrived at home, but not stuck, connecting to the ground, but also to the third eye. Mm. Up and down. Yeah, how can we live as a good ladder between these two? Wonderful reflections. Let's just all sense into these together. Fabulous. Concentric vessels, writes Les. Smaller inside the larger. Mm. From Sue, connected, complex, and simple. From Ruth, the drawing gives me a sense of a body of water undulating. And from Cecilia, an inner oval, a whirlpool deepening into the body. An ordered typhoon somehow. We're getting these beautiful koans. They, you know, they seem to be yeah, these pairs of opposites that are animating our experience. Keep them coming, they're really wonderful. I'd like to um, invite you also to put some questions into the chat window now. Anything you'd like to ask Kendra, anything you'd like to um, follow up there, please feel free to do so. And I'm um, passing back over to Les. Thank you. So, yeah, we enter the time for questions. Um, actually, I'll bring in Nick as well, because Nick, you may have been looking. Um, I don't know if there are any specific questions that have come in the chat window. But uh, so, Nick, if there are, you can perhaps articulate those. And at the same time, because we're not such a large group, if anyone would like to either put a question there now, or even better, unmute yourself. Uh, this is your opportunity. So if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question for Kendra, then we could do it that way as well. Uh, I guess this is for Kendra from Cecilia. Can I read some more of your women's spiritual stories? Uh, yes, certainly. I uh, the the research that I did for my dissertation is um, is is published. Although I think it's perhaps accessible only through um, academic databases. I don't have it. Um, I don't have some of these published in other in other locations. So it depends, Celia, if you have access to um, um, an academic database or not. Um, you can actually read the entire dissertation or perhaps less, maybe you have a suggestion for that. Well, I was wondering, I don't want to put more work in your direction, Kendra. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there we have, you know, the Isle of Trust has a blog. Um, so it might be that you could just write a simple piece which brings some of those stories in. I think people ah. would be very interested in that. I would be happy to do that. Ah. Yeah, so maybe so maybe that's a stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, so thank, okay. th thank you, Cecilia. That was a... <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> I'm going to write a note to myself so that I don't forget. <laughs> and uh, so I, I was looking whether there's other questions. I, I, I'm not seeing any right now. So again, encourage people to, to put questions but it, until there are more questions, I have questions. I always have questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was wondering, I mean, this may, you know, be beyond the research you were doing, but maybe you've got some general thoughts because you're talking about specifically women's spiritual narrative or stories. Um, it seems to me that there are, there are gender differences. And again, thinking about the times we're living through, this question of gender is such a big question at the moment. Mm -hmm. And you know, I wonder if it's sort of tied in on a larger scale with all these, mm. these disruptions that seem to be heading in our direction. So yeah, the question in there is, well, the simple part of the question is, are male spiritual stories 
different from female, but you may not have researched that specifically. And the larger question, I think, in there is, you know, is about the sort of the changing face of spirituality in our day, and whether the you know the shifting uh, the shifting sense of gender is is a part of that change in spiritual narratives in some way. Yeah. If you see what, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, and I see. I mean, and you've there's there's a few questions in there, um, in what you were asking, and I, to go to the first question that you were asking around um, if the stories are different, and I would say to that it it really depends on what the dominant narrative is. Um, some of my research really focused on hidden experiences that women have or taboo experiences that women go through and the ways in which the dominant narrative doesn't um, allow space for those stories to be, to be heard or to be told. And I think that that can be true for anybody, regardless of, of gender, especially right now, because gender, you know, what is gender? There's, you know, there's uh, gender fluidity. There's a way in which the, the youth talk about gender that, that is different than the way we talk about gender. Yeah. And so I think, you know, I think it really goes into, you know, what is the dominant narrative? And for those who are outside of that dominant narrative, you know, um, what are their experiences that aren't actually being reflected back? And I think that's where it comes to the importance of telling stories is that when we see our narrative reflected back to us, that's when we start to develop and gain power and understanding and, and power in the sense of, I mean, like empowerment, like an, uh, an understanding or, or an evolving of our own self within that. Um, so uh, I think that answers yeah. part of your question, but there was a second question in there that I, I sort of lost um, perhaps in my reflection. No, I think, you, I think you answered the second question, which is about the you know, more fluidity around gender. Mm -hmm. I noticed that uh, Cecilia has, has cheated by asking me a question. That's not allowed. <laughs> what new narrative might emerge, do you think, Les? <laughs> so my answer to that is uh, a later one in this series will be Jessica and myself talking. So maybe I'll, I'll talk about that uh, at, on that occasion. J but just briefly, you know, it's far from me to resist the opportunity. Uh, I, I think the point is that gender is just one manifestation of polarity. Yeah, mm -hmm. or complementarity. I mean, it's again that's par you know paradox we talked about before, mm -hmm. and and I think that there's so many polarities slash complementarities that are brought to the fore by this pandemic. It's 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 really I think it's uncanny actually the way in which you know, like older younger. You know why should this virus seem to be selective in relation to the age of those who succumb to it. Now, if you look historically, I mean, of course, there's been many pandemics. and Generally, they probably were more dangerous to younger people. Uh, so what's going on now? It's as if, as if there's something out of balance between the generations. Mm -hmm. So it's not just gender. There's a whole range of so where the balance lies in our cultures, in our societies. So I think it is interesting. Um, the mm -hmm. bi I'm quoting from Owen there, the bisexual hermaphrodite god slash goddess. Yeah. Yeah. We do have a question here. And Sue has asked, do you think the timing of this pandemic, the wake-up call the world has been waiting for, is evidence or proof of higher intelligence at work? Hmm. I mean, that certainly gets into sort of esoteric, um, quite spiritual concepts. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I think um, 
uh, I've less perhaps if you have some ideas on this too, I might pull you in on this too, because I, I sort of feel there's there's a part of me that that wants to say, well, yes, that's certainly that's certainly possible. I mean, if we think about the um, right, the Earth having an intelligence, right? One one viewpoint that I've seen sort of you know communicated out there is that you know we weren't paying attention to climate change. And our, our earth was, was ineffectively, you know, in effect was, was dying. And perhaps this was a way for, for Gaia, for the earth to, you know, to, to regenerate because that's certainly what we're seeing, right? I mean, I don't, I certainly am not making light of any of the crises or loss that we have experienced as this pandemic. My, I mean, I, I, I feel that very deeply. And I've also seen, you know, how, you know, the the skies have cleared. I mean, if I, I remember kind of to, even towards the beginning, seeing photos of, of Delhi mm. and you could actually see the sky. And if, you know, if you've ever been to India, if you've been in one of the, the larger cities, it's, you know, you can't see the sky. It's just, it's so, it, there's so much pollution there. And so perhaps, you know, there is, there is a higher intelligence at work. Um, I think that's just one example that I've, I've sort of seen out there. Um, and uh, just come in, Sue Bradley, uh, going back to the last point about polarity has brought in, I think, a really important point when I was talking about polarities and she's mentioned about Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. which, of course, you know, when you look at it in that way, in terms of the, the, you know, the balance and so on, as I was saying, I think that's hugely, hugely part of what is unfolding. But coming yeah. back to the question about higher intelligence, you know, since you invited me to come in, Kendra, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I would say, uh, this is what, I would say either yes or no, you know, in other words, it's one of those questions. It's, it's like, I mean, in my area, you know, is consciousness a product of the brain or is the brain a product of consciousness? You know, and, and we don't really have the data to give a definitive answer. Mm -hmm. So the question I would put in a different way, I would say, which is more valuable to us as individuals, you know, as a species, which approach is more valuable? Is it actually going to be constructive to think that there is a higher intelligence? And I don't mean a god in a kind of old-fashioned way, but it might be, as some have written there, you know, the collective, the collective psyche, Gaia, all this, as you mentioned, Kendra. So is it more valuable, constructive, generative for us to grasp that way of seeing things or the more mechanistic? the more reductive. And I, I know what my answer to that is. So, you know, the answer is not, do we have the data to really answer the question? No, we don't. But do we know what the consequences of taking one position or the other is, that are? What is the consequence? Yes, we do know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. We know that taking the larger scale always opens up greater possibilities and it's more healing in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, what you just said too, Les, kind of just brings me back to, you know, just the, what we've been talking about today in regard to, you know, how, how we open ourselves up to new possibilities and new ways of, of living our lives and living our lives as individuals and, and living our lives in community and how, how, we, how we build that, you know how we construct that and um you know um if we if we hold this this paradox right that we are individuals in the world you know of course this comes from my own perspective right if we if we are individuals in this world who construct our identities and sense of self within the world via the via the environments that we live in and we are also connected at a much deeper level than that, or we have a level of knowing that is beyond, if you will, those constructed identities that, that we have built or that we have come to live with, 
then perhaps the the process or you know is really this process of of is, paradox isn't just sort of this static thing but it's a it's a living way in which we are learning to to evolve or to grow into a state of wholeness and holding all of this yeah so i i think i'm going to pass back to jessica for the closing shortly I just wonder if there's any particular practice that you think, you know, is, is appropriate. I think you, you kind of alluded to them as we've gone along. Uh, is there anything else you would like to say around practice? And you, uh, like a sp- I mean, I think the practice that you brought up was a really great one, the who am I, mm-hmm. you know, or who are you? You know, you can mm-hmm. certainly do it as an individual practice, so it becomes who, who am I. Um, I think, you know, um, you have to do what works when it comes to practices. Um, I think, you know, um, for me, the practice of, of meditation and, and, and going inward and, and, and also, you know, moving the body were, were practices that helped me uncover some of these parts of myself that I just you know, couldn't see or I needed to recognize. And so I I think when it comes to practices, I I always say, you you know, you have to do what works for you. Um, And, you know, as you're doing what works for you, meant for me, or at least the point that I hold is that the hope is that whatever practice you're engaging with, it's into a deeper relationship with that part of yourself that is is inside and is the wise part of yourself that can help you see with more clarity who you are in the world. That's great. Thank you so much, Kendra. Thank you. uh, Pass back to Jessica at this point. Thank you very much. I've been listening in and at the same time, there's been another voice that's entered into my space. My cat arrived halfway through. (laughs) Just want to say hello. (laughs) <laughs> and um, she's been quite vocal so it, it also reminded me of that sense of again opening the aperture of awareness and connecting beyond ourselves right when we're speaking of that deeper source something perhaps flowing through us informing us and also her and the wider body of the earth and the ecosystems that we're a part of feels so crucial to, for us, for all of us to hold that in our awareness. And you know, I say these words and then that, that feels so lofty, you know, when with some people are in, in very deep crisis, having lost their job, have, you know, struggling at home with children and all of that. But it's this both and that we're, we, we're dealing with acute crisis and we're needing to navigate through those. And then we're also holding in awareness the larger. And I think I want to leave you with that, with that thought of this both and. Um, and a number of you have brought this up um, in, in your comments on the chat window. So we want to deepen into these themes with you um, over the coming months. If you want to come back, you're most welcome. So on screen right now, you're seeing the dialogues that are scheduled to take place in in August, September and October. So please do come back and um, please also feel free to follow up with us. So you can reach us through the the website, you can email us. We'd love to hear your questions and we would really love to nurture an ongoing dialogue with you. So we hope to see you again and we thank you for joining us today and for bringing yourselves in. And as always, I wish we had more time to you know, deep, dive into these, these questions and explorations more deeply because there's, there's so much here that um, we're all sitting with and that we're all working through. But yeah, a big thanks to Kendra and, and Les for holding the dialogue. And again, thank you to all of you for being here today. Perhaps you want to unmute yourselves and say goodbye. Mm-hmm. That would be lovely. Thanks, Kendra. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.